I'm Ben Cotton. I'm the Fedora Program Manager or Chief Cat Herding Officer. Um, that's me. Uh, Matthew is next on my list. Hi, I am Matthew Miller. I am the current Fedora Project Leader. I also herd cats, but uh, like I try to listen to them as well, whereas Ben just tells them what to do. And Marie? Yeah, hi, I'm Marie Norden. I am Fedora's Community Action and Impact Coordinator, or F-Cake. I also herd cats, but I like to think I also just like hang out with them and we just chill, I don't know, something like that. All right, I'm done. Spot? Um, hey, I'm Spot. Uh, I break things and then I let cats clean up the mess. <laughs> And Spot is one of the elected members of the Fedora Council. Yeah, suckers. Yeah, you voted for him. <laughs> David. Hello, I am David Cantrell, and uh, I am elected to FESCO, but I'm also uh, in the capacity of the FESCO representative for the council. So that is why I'm here. So uh, that means I... I help with escalating FESCO issues to the council when we want the council's input or just keeping the council up to date on engineering kind of specifics. The majority of my time though is spent uh, following FESCO issues, commenting, not commenting, voting, things like that. Uh, I've been working on this stuff for a long time. Um, I'm not even gonna bother to list it, list it, but I will say I have a cat I adopted an injured cat from the animal shelter. It has no tail. All right, Alberto. Hmm. Hmm. We'll come back to Alberto. Vipul. Hello, uh, I'm Vipul. I'm diversity and inclusion advisor to Federal Council. I work in infrastructure and I guess I'm one of the cats, but seems like cats have a lot of responsibility here. So. A smaller cat. Uh, Sumantro? Hey, I'm Sumantro, and I work for the Federal QA team. I'm currently leading the objective of community revamp with Marie and uh, Mariana. Um, I am probably one of the small cats in the full Fedora ecosystem. <laughs> Not necessarily noticed most of the times, but sometimes there. <laughs> Akash? Right, so I work on websites, applications, mentorship, and packaging side of things with a lot of excited and exciting cats. And uh, that's kind of what I do at night, but uh, what I do at day is work for the cat CP. Uh, Ramya? Hi, everyone. I am Federal Web and Apps uh, co lead. Um, it's basically make sure that the objective is up and running and stuff like that. Very happy to be here. Hey, everyone. Okay, um, looks like Alberto has left and will hopefully rejoin. Um, and Marie is around in the chat as well. Um, Alexandra Fedorova uh, let us know that she won't be able to join today. Uh, and Mariana is here so that we have now heard from everyone. Um, so Mariana, do you wanna introduce yourself real quick? Oh, we have Alberto back. So, uh, Alberto, would you please introduce yourself? Ah, sure. I'm Alberto Rodriguez. Yes. Yet another happy Fedora contributor. I'm so the, I'm also are the main share representative um, council. So, hi, everyone. So, the Fedora Council is basically the governance and leadership body at the top of our org chart, or actually the middle of our org chart, which is nice. We don't have a top to our org chart. It's a nicely, um, yeah, are you gonna bring it up, Marie? Beautiful. Um, so uh, we we try to set the overall strategy for the project, but um, like the joke about there not being something at the top is actually on purpose because we're not really a top-driven organization. We are a community-driven organization where our job is to listen to the community feedback overall and to help help the community set our collective strategy and then execute on it. 
Um, and so that's that's our basic job. So there are some full-time members of the council, uh, two of us paid by Red Hat to be full-time council members, that's Marie and I. Uh, ben is program manager, is also paid by, uh, by Red Hat to do that full-time, but is technically an auxiliary council member. It's kind of a complicated structure for which we had good reasons at the time, and it's working well enough that we are keeping it this way. Um, we also have two completely elected representatives, and then the two roles, the mindshare and engineering, which are appointed by their uh, their respective bodies. So. Uh, that kind of keeps things to a balance and because we decide everything by consensus those two uh, elected positions have a pretty strong weight because if some one of the elected positions says no this should not happen uh, that that's a block until we figure out a way to get more of the community on on board um, and it, it generally generally works out pretty well uh, and then we also have um, the diversity advisor and the objective leads on the council as well to get more of a broad input from people actually doing things and working on things in the project. So there's a question here in the Q&A that is good to address. What kind of questions should you ask us? Is strategy, uh, can we ask about strategy? Absolutely ask about strategy. I think this is a pretty open session. This is a, hey, this is a chance for community to connect with Tom, the community to connect with the council and ask us things directly because, you know, we're all all over the place living our lives and it's hard to pin us down in one spot. So feel free to ask away. Um, to see, oh, there's a couple that actually popped up if we want to do those. Ben, would you like to moderate these questions? That depends on if you can hear me or not. We can. It's good for now. Okay. All right, we'll go for it. Um, so one question is, what area of Fedora needs the most assistance? Testing, relens, docs? I would say all of the above. Like, there's no area where we have yeah. enough contributors. Right. If you have to pick one of those, I would say docs is probably the area where we could most use some help because all the other areas can also benefit from docs. Uh, so it's a nice way to help across all sorts of different things. I don't have a, there's no hand raise in here, but I was going to say also other non-coding things. There's plenty of organizational project management, community outreach, design, writing. There's all kinds of stuff to do. And the way to figure out how to get involved in that is to either talk with the join folks or the Mindshare committee. So um, there's this thing called the Websites and Apps Revamp, which is coming up. So we'll just turn the Get Fedora and all the exciting things, all the exciting ways that we interact with the world around with the redesign, both in the way of how it looks and how it interacts with people. So uh, if you're someone who knows about these things, feel free to join us. That is something that we'd need some assistance with. The next question is, what is our strategy with respect to Silver Blue? Are we looking for that to be the new default download anytime soon? It has a lot of positive vibes in the external community outside of Fedora. So uh, I think it is likely to be the future. Um, like you said, it's got a lot of positive vibes. People are excited about it. It's cool technology. Um, but on the same time, some of the things that it solves, like making updates go Cleanly, like our updates have actually been working really nicely. People's upgrades are easy, and like we haven't gotten a lot of complaints in those areas. Um, so it's not like there's a fire. We don't have to move over urgently to fix a broken thing. But it is uh, interesting new technology. The alignment with the IoT and CoreOS is cool. Um, and I think it's probably where we want to go, but there are also a lot of hard things that aren't solved yet, like how can Chrome work? Um, and so, so, you know, they're kind of important. And I know that people are working on those things, um, but we don't have a lot of people working on them. Um, so it's something we can we can be careful with and wait until like we really feel like it's a good thing to to make be the default. Um, I think I think it will be a really useful thing, especially if we can like ship on more hardware. Um, it's really nice to QA a defined set of packages as this is the QA set and be able to tell people this is what 
this is what works um, and you can do all these other things but you're outside of what we support and uh, that's a useful thing for a lot of people and silver blue makes it easier to do that kind of thing um, so i think we'll probably see that in the future but i think it's probably a several years off thing rather than like a next year thing follow-up question is so the main blocker on silver blue is chrome support uh, that just comes, so uh, I think Chrome actually works, but it doesn't work in a container because it doesn't work very well with Flatpak um, because they, it has its own sandboxing. Uh, I think Spot probably knows more about that, but um, may not want to actually talk about it for fear of unleashing demons from beyond. <laughs> I mean, I think there's lots of cases that are out there that we know of where things don't work in the silver blue style environment. Um, Tech Live is a great example of this. Tech Live assumes it can constantly write to slash USR, and it can't. <laughs> and unraveling that is not on my to-do list at the moment. Uh, but if someone came to me with patches and said, hey, we fixed this, I would happily carry them. Um, I think it's a lot of identifying use cases that we expect to work in the base release and making sure that the package sets that are in Fedora align well with those use cases. And uh, I, I would love to see that work happen. Uh, I certainly think it's a interesting paradigm, uh, but I, I don't know. I think Matt's timeline is probably uh, the right one. Cool, okay, we have another question. Uh, are there any plans to introduce sandbox applications and what about new cool wallpapers for Fedora 35? Two questions, I guess. Let's take the sandbox applications first. David, do you want to do that one from a Fesco point of view? I mean, I, I suppose, but I it, the, the topic comes up and generally with, with Fesco, we process things you know, as a discussion first on the development list. Uh, well, not always, but that's kind of the preferred path is to bring the discussion up there. And then that helps us gauge if there's interest. And then if there's interest, what do people want to focus on first? What do the users want to see first? And then we can talk about the, the engineering details from there. So, um, I mean, I haven't really seen anything, any specific request, but I just know that, you know, there's, there's kind of uh, discussions around that. And I would personally like to see us pursue something there. I don't have a good idea of what would be a, a good first attempt though. Um, Sandboxing is hard. I mean, it, it's 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 a great concept, but if you look at what Chromium has to do to sandbox and how often it breaks, like the code that handles the sandboxing logic inside of Chromium and Chrome is not easy to understand. <laughs> yeah, it's it's and that that's a good example of one that is ideal that people are like, yeah, I like the I like the idea of that being sandbox. Um, really, I think any any end user application that kind of fits in that category, so maybe a classic kind of like desktop style application where if you're not on um, Linux, I, I don't know what, what else do people use. I've heard there's other OSs, um, but uh, let's say you're, you're installing, you know, Microsoft Word or something like that. Those are applications that on Windows and on Mac OS don't come with the OS. And we've always approached it differently in the world of Linux and, and even further back with just Unix where everything is kind of unified together. But from a user perspective and from a developer perspective, being able to have kind of like these isolated you know, sandboxes where I can drop things on the system easily independent of the OS updates uh, just makes it easier. But we get into the challenge with how do we implement that? Uh, is there one good way to do it? Um, should we support more than one way? What things are good? Like Tech Live, you know, I mean, from a payload perspective is a nice idea 
to be sandboxed. But then from a from a user perspective, you think about the people using those tools, they kind of expect them to be integrated with the system. So then you get kind of the, the messy situation. I've looked at some sandboxing, um, uh, I mean, just sort of broadly speaking, like sandboxing, uh, systems implementations i don't know what do you want to call it uh, we have flat pack which is really nice in uh in fedora uh, and i like it uh but i've also looked at uh, the app image stuff that kind of exists out in the wild and that's a neat idea too from a technical standpoint it's not quite there like you you can get one of these sort of bundles and they're very they're similar to like uh like a, a mac os bundle uh where everything is crammed in in the in the directory and it's kind of like this not quite a true rooted environment but it knows how to find its own libraries and stuff like that that's neat except the app image stuff still needs some host requirements that make it a little tricky so i've run into things that ran fine on say fedora 32 and then on fedora 33 stopped working so those are little quirks that i think we'll have to deal with over time whatever makes it nicer for users but also something that is easy for us to manage from an engineering standpoint and and not be so opaque and difficult for new contributors to use would be great what that system would be i don't know awesome that was a really in-depth answer thank you for that um and then uh someone asked about wallpapers for F35. So the design team is working on a wallpaper right now. I'm actually involved in that. I did some pretty cool marbling photography. So we'll see if that ends up being a part of the mix. Um, but like most things in Fedora are extra fun things like the supplemental wallpapers were, you know, that was really one person's effort to make that happen and things changed in their life. So we recently haven't had the supplemental wallpaper um, thing that we do, but if someone wanted to step up and start running that again, we'd be more than happy to support that to happen. Um, okay, so let's see what else we got going here. <laughs> I think we have a couple more in our Q&A. So, I'm going to start at the top. Is there any possibility to provide the Fedora Flatpak runtime installed out of the box, not the portal only? It's almost a gigabyte in size. I'm going to defer that one to the Fedora Workstation Working Group. That's not a council level decision on that kind of thing. Like that's that's an engineering decision for that group. Gotcha. Okay. The next one is who is our biggest competitor and why? Now that's a council level thing. Absolutely. Um, I would say uh, our biggest competitor is Microsoft Windows because that's where most of the systems are that are not running Fedora Linux yet. Um, followed by Mac OS because I think there's a neck and neck thing for uh, like software developers and kind of the actual specific target market of users that we might really do well in. Um, I think those are so those those are our two main competitors um, in the Linux operating system space, it's, and we mostly compete with free Linux. We don't really compete with on the enterprise level. That's our, that's our niche. Uh, Ubuntu is obviously the most popular Linux distribution for in, in that space by, you know, quite a lot. And so um, if I, I think we're best to focus on commercial operating systems because there's plenty of room to grow without Linux infighting and um, a lot of things that you know benefit Ubuntu and benefit us like that that all we, we both grow um, but you know it, I wouldn't mind taking a couple points of share from from Ubuntu that that'd be fine um. cool thanks for that answer Matthew okay so Let's do that one's going to be a long one. We'll leave that one maybe till the end. Okay. What are Fedora's basic objectives? Why we all are all here and working on these projects and what do we want to achieve? I would love for someone other than me to answer this question. Take me to your leader. <laughs> We I'm, should all be able to answer this question. I'm just here for the cast. I really don't want to bring it up. 
I'm just bringing up the website so I can just read off of it. I, I think you're going to get, <laughs> right. you know, different answers from different people, but um, I'll start and I think we should all chime in. Um, but I think Fedora, we've talked about this uh, over the years. Uh, when you look at, at how it got started, you know, we were a Linux distribution. We are a Linux distribution. That's our primary project. But you look at how it's evolved and we're a community, we're an open source community that's fundamental to what we do. We've been, we've strongly adhered to that. And I think that Fedora as a community project can or should strive to provide a good workspace for other projects to start and grow under that Fedora umbrella. And that for, from my point of view means providing the tools and the platform that enable that, um, making it attractive uh, to people for, for projects to want to, you know, use our tools, our platform, stuff like that, and then have sort of these policies and procedures and uh, all of the sort of mechanics around how you run an organization set up so that it's inviting and welcoming and things like that. Someone else go after me, please. <laughs> I, I'm going to plus so, one what oh, you said. <laughs> but, but if you go to the Fedora's mission and vision page, um, you will find that it says almost exactly what David just said in entirely different words. So I think uh, you, you've internalized that very well, or we've internalized, or we've documented yeah. that that thing that you're you're saying. Um, it, it's it's very much that. Yeah. Yeah, I think. To a large degree, operating systems have become boring, and I think they should be because a boring operating system is a stable and reliable operating system, and that's what gives people the ability to do, uh, you know, the cool things that actually help people. Um, you know, I, building an operating system is not my end goal. It's a thing that we do that um, gives people the power to do useful things like make art or, you know, do science and you do research and things like that. Um, so, you know, I think David's answer really hits it on the nose. And it's it's worth adding to that, that uh, it's it's not so much that that the OS has become boring. It's that in a way we've we've kind of achieved that where, you know, 10, 20 years ago, if we were doing one of these conferences, the talks would be about, hey, when is my mouse going to work? When are you going to get my screen to work? All those things that we had to do, all that groundwork that had to be laid, we're at that point. So now we can do what we really want to do, uh, you know, provide that platform, enable people to do what they really want to do. <laughs> cool. Well, I think that was pretty good. I think we can move to the next question. So this one, I don't think we're gonna have time for everyone to each council member to talk about both of these things, but I'm sure a few people will want to chime in. So what is one thing each council member thinks is a highlight or a success and a challenge or failure in the last year? I can go first. <laughs> sure. um, I'm going to say code of conduct. It was a real challenge for um, the people managing that. Um, we had more than two times the number we had in previous, most of the previous year's average. So there was a lot to manage. And if you think about, there was a report on it. So there was over 20 uh, incidents or things that we were managing. So that's like one every other week kind of a thing or more. Sometimes they pop up all at once and that was definitely a challenge. And uh, some of those things we face together as a council, but I think that the challenge behind that challenge is the pandemic. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we've all been through so much and just from my own personal life, I can, I'm just guessing everyone else is dealing with personal stuff too, beyond the variety of uh, dramas and different things that have actually happened in the open source world over the past four to six months. So there's been a lot of things and that has been a huge challenge for sure. I'm gonna say the success is our virtual events, right? So uh, I can just look right now, but I think we have almost 700 registrations. Um, and that is way more than we had last year. I think we had total like 490 or something. So we're already like, we're growing. The virtual events have really brought 
Fedorans together and uh, allow them to connect with the council, Mindshare Committee, um, developers who are working on these things every day. So the, the quality of that engagement that any random contributor might have has actually been better than when we were doing something, when we were doing Flock, right? Because only a certain amount of people could go to Flock and now it's accessible for so many more. So I'm gonna say that's where I'm at and I'll, I'll let someone else jump in. Uh, I think Lenovo shipping Fedora was a great success in my opinion and hopefully more coming soon. So I was really excited about that. Talking about challenges that uh, are there on my perspective is kind of incentivizing a long-term contribution. So um, it's kind of easy to explain what there is good about open source and why you should contribute to it. But if it goes to articulating it in real terms, when you're trying to put that coding that you learned in the school or design uh, that you learned in your college to actually doing something uh, for a long term, that is when uh, things kind of uh, come up front that uh, there can be challenges across maybe uh, time zones or uh, there might be some kind of abstractions you don't really know who to reach out to this is something that we're trying to deal with constantly using the join sec but uh, yeah we're getting there it's slow but we are getting there that's certain I, I would say a challenge that uh, was handled well uh, for us, it wasn't something that we had a direct control over, but definitely impacted us was the implosion of Freenode. Um, and we had to sort of migrate everything. And, and you know, we had long, long standing sort of working relationships with upstream communities on Freenode, our own channels. Um, and then it, it it was really interesting to step back and watch that sort of resolve itself in a relatively short amount of time, um, which I I thought was was really good. And and the the replacement on Libera uh, was kind of set up for us already, which was nice. So it's it was a challenge, but uh, didn't seem too bad. I want to call out the new logo <laughs> as a, a long time coming, happy to see it. Um, I know that's both a success and challenge for us as we move forward. Uh, but uh, I think it's great that we finally got to the to that point and we're moving forward and, and continuing to find all the places where the old logo is still hiding and replace them. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm really pleased to see that work uh, continue. I see one on Ben's shirt. We're going to have to like get updated. <laughs> Spot the old logo. <laughs> exactly yes. what I was going to see. <laughs> so does anyone else have any burning uh, victories or challenges? Go ahead. Yeah, I do. So I just want to highlight that the revamp is going on. That was a huge highlight success on mine because I'm really excited about it and I want to see how that's going to happen. Challenge is not directly related to Fedora, but I think pandemic did have a little challenge on everyone. Like, I know that maybe I think that everyone on the console right now had an in-person contact at some point or the other. I feel I missed it out because of the pandemic, because once I joined, everything was virtual. Although it's great that it reduces a lot of barriers of traveling and all that. But then I think that's like, that's a personal challenge. I feel that in person would have been really exciting too. that one, yeah. That's definitely a challenge, not being able to connect with everybody in person. Yeah. We've, I, as for our council, we try to do an in-person meetup twice a year uh, one, one associated with events and one like where we're right, you know, which is just the council and that's been really valuable and the virtual version of that has been okay, but also has felt like more meetings, um, not the same thing. Yeah. All right. Can we move to the next question? Okay. Uh, when are we going to introduce a mobile OS of Fedora? 
there are people working on it. There is a Fedora Mobility SIG, and if you're interested in that, you should join with that. Um, I, it's a hard problem because uh, in order to actually like be on mobile hardware that uh, isn't you know developer oriented hardware, like the hoops to go through to do that are much larger than something like getting it to go on a Lenovo laptop. Um, and this is a space where uh, Microsoft dropped out because they didn't feel like they could be competitive, right? So, like, um, it, that's a hard space to go into. And I know Neil Gampa always yells at me for being negative whenever this comes up. So I don't mean to, like, take away from the fun of people who want to work on this. I think it's actually really important and really cool. Um, I'm happy to see that PinePhone is, like, a thing that's kind of taking off and being interesting. Um, I, I, I think we will have a version uh, if Fedora Linux of some sort that runs on the Pine phone, um, that'll be cool. Um, poss possibly the KDE folks are looking at putting together a KDE Plasma based phone thing for that. That would be great to see. So that's in the works. Join that if you're interested. Cool. Thanks. All right. We have another here. Are there ideas to bring more multimedia codecs back into the official repos so RPM Fusion isn't needed anymore to get stable streaming in the browsers working correctly. I'm looking at Spot. <laughs> All right. All right. So the basic answer is those things are cannot be in Fedora Linux because they have um, patent encumbered by patents, and we can not ship them. We don't have we don't have legal permission to, um, so it's out of our hands. Um, as those things reach the end of their patent lifetime, we do try to bring them in. That's why you can play MP3s out of the box uh, now. Um, so some of it is just a waiting game. And you know, uh, I talked a little bit about politics before, like this is some politics that affect us. Uh, software patents are really bad for open source and we should fight against them. That's some politics I think we can all get behind. And that, that's what's blocking us from doing that. Cool, that's a pretty straightforward answer. Uh, I think we can move to the next. So this is a two-parter by two people. I'm just going to combine them because they go together. So how do we attract new talent uh, to go open source with Fedora? And building on that, do you forecast a future Linux skills shortage? My junior colleagues consume and deploy cloud PAAS services and don't need to go install and use an OS as much. So how do we attract new talent and continue to attract new talent and keep interest? Um, okay. A big part of it kind of goes to mentorship, to be honest. Yeah. If people come in with some uh, talent, maybe it's a very little in amount, but it's totally fine. We could take that little amount, add something more by ourselves as a community or as an enabler, and we could uh, scale that to new heights and maybe use that talent in uh, delivering our offerings, you know, the things that we make. Also, there are programs that we have on the summer coding that uh, people can be part of. So uh, be it outreachy, be it GSOC or other stuff, they've joined SIG where people can just jump right in, say hi, and there are always folks who are just willing to communicate and see how it works out for them or you know, understand why is it so that they're so interested to contribute. But that's uh, how we can obviously get started. But yeah, it's, it's kind of a challenge. Uh, the graph is, uh, the graph of growth is not quite a straight line which just goes in a constant angle. It can be going fast in some time and then sometimes it might not even look as if, if it's moving. So uh, mentorship, that's kind of uh, how we think uh, it, it might just help. It's a slow process uh, that builds upon over time. And well, mentorship can also be incentivized with the programs that I just talked about. What do other folks think? Yeah, I, I was gonna, say the same thing basically is uh, I do uh, see, you know, kind of a, a shortage of, uh, of people with, um, you know, what I would consider basic uh, operating system skills. Um, but that goes back to our earlier point where, you know, the OS is, is kind of boring at this point, it does work, but that doesn't mean we don't need to make sure we're attracting people that want to work on that because it's boring because we expect it to work and it does. So we are going to need people that 
have an interest in that space or or in some something else that enables the rest of the platform. So it's a matter of, I think, you know, having a, a wide variety of talks at uh, events like this so that we get the information out there for projects so that people can see it and then aligning that with with mentoring programs, uh, either through Summer of Code, Outreachy, anything else that we set up um, it, it is, is, I think, is the best way um, because I think how probably any of us got involved with this, it, it was, you know, you, you knew someone who kind of helped you along, you know, it was maybe an informal mentoring kind of thing. And we need to just make sure we do that as a project uh, and really focus on that uh, as much as we can. I want to add one more thing uh, to that. Uh, I also, I think we should, it would be a great idea to revamp talk, talks a little bit to have a good flow. I think docs would be the face of any product for anyone to actually, anyone would go first and look at the docs. So I think along with mentorship, when we have a good flow of docs on how to contribute and because not every time someone would be available to mentor. So that's when docs would come into play and kind of provide the step-by-step -step guide on how this can be done. It's time taking, but I think that would be like, it would be great to have a good, doc documentation thing for, especially for contributing to attract new contributors and especially to the open source cool does anyone else have responses for that one all right i'm going to the next all right what's one thing in fedora which is almost better than any other os as a dev or a user and maybe it's why you feel motivated to contribute so I guess what's your favorite thing about Fedora? The community. Yep. Yeah, hands down, the community. Yeah. I think by our nature as a project of integration and with our motto of upstream first, where we try to make sure that there are things in Fedora that we share with everybody, it's hard to find something that is unique to Fedora Linux that you can't find in a different Linux distribution. And that's actually one of our strengths. Like that's one of the things that's great about us that we, we don't try and make it, this is just an exclusive thing. This is part of, you know, operating system for everybody. And that includes other Linux distributions as well. Uh, well, to me, honestly, it kind of comes down to the first, uh, you know, the first pillar of uh, ours that we kind of make sure that we get things to folks as soon as it, it comes out in a way that it's very polished and it can be just, you know, in a usable state. Take, for example, GNOME 40. Uh, we were one of the first distributions to get it out. And, uh, well, it's kind of out there that it's one of the most pol uh, polished distributions which have been able to do it. So. Uh, kind of has to do with stable things while also making sure that we are not staying way back just for the stability. So that's kind of what drives me to contribute to Linux, uh, Fedora and keep using it as my primary distribution. I, I'm also gonna go with that friends. Uh, that's my favorite <laughs> favorite thing about Fedora, and I think we're better than everyone else. Wait, no, um, <laughs> uh, I think that <laughs> um, it's just it. You know, the connections I have with people in the community really do motivate me to make experiences like this for for everyone to enjoy. Um, you know, beyond just being in the council, of course. But I think uh, we're kind of almost all in agreement on that one. Um, so let's go to the next. Okay, are there any plans to collaborate with the recently announced CentOS automotive, automotive SIG? And what, if any relationship will exist with Fedora? Ooh, I know this one, it's easy. Um, that SIG is directly working with the Fedora IoT group and is a part of the Fedora IoT working group is going to bridge into the CentOS automotive SIG. Um, so yeah, straightforward. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Great to see Lenovo working on better, wider support for Fedora, but usually this means that all focus goes to latest and greatest hardware. 
would it be possible to nudge them to look at widening their support? I can take uh, this one too. Go, go ahead, David. I was just going to ask, does that mean like older systems, maybe some years back or not just, I, I don't, I don't understand the scope, but yeah. Matthew, you, you, I, you were going to answer. Right. So. That's how I read that question too. And I, I think the answer is the mechanism by which Lenovo is able to make Linux support better doesn't work for that way. And that is Lenovo, like uh, I, this was really actually eye-opening to me learning how laptops are made, right? Um, it, it, it in some ways make putting together a laptop is like putting together a Linux distribution. Uh, they are using a lot of upstream to them components that they assemble into a laptop. And so when they go to make a new model, they basically go to a bunch of vendors and say, we need a fingerprint reader, we need a you know, this, we, all these different components, and then they they expect them out and then have them put in. And so uh, one of the things that they're doing now is telling those vendors this thing needs to support open source out of the box Linux drivers. And so that's the leverage they have. Um, whereas they don't really go like Lenovo, al although they sometimes they, they've, they've got have engineering software uh, hardware people, mostly they don't write these drivers. They depend on them existing at, from the component level. And so their influence is over what components they can put into it. And so, for example, the, the fingerprint reader on the earlier X1 carbons, there is some, I guess there's now some reverse engineered work on it, but Lenovo isn't going to go back and enable those because it's just, it's, it's old hardware to them. They're, they're going to, basically say in the future all fingerprint readers have to work with fedora linux um so yeah that that's basically just the way that works um on the other part of widening things we definitely hope to have it available on more models but covid has just torpedoed the supply chain so um we're we're at this point, fortunate that they're able to ship one model with Fedora Linux on it, and hopefully that will get better in the future once you know computer chips are available again. Turns out those are important for making a laptop. Cool. So I think we have time for one more question. It was that long when I mentioned. Okay, so building on the state of Fedora keynote, what does each council member think is next for Fedora? This could be a pie in the sky dream or something very concrete and targeted. So I will do mine first. <laughs> uh, I think the next big thing, especially for like Mindshare and for me to work on is hybrid events. So uh, eventually, hopefully, we're going to be coming back to in person, at least partially, to, to be able to see each other and connect as we were talking about earlier. But we don't want to take away all of this amazing content um, from everyone you know, we've moved and now we can't go back. <laughs> so we need to have a uh, hybrid events and, and what is that gonna look like? Not quite sure yet. Um, so definitely looking to hear the community's feedback on good experiences and bad. And that's what I got. My pie in the sky is I would love to see Fedora continue to grow as a platform for gaming and game development. I think that would be really cool to see. I would love to create new opportunities to ride the wave that Valve and Steam have been accomplishing for a lot of uh, Linux gaming. And uh, things like O3DE, uh, open sourcing is very exciting to me. I'm trying to figure out a way to get that shoved into Fedora. Um, and uh, and I would love to see uh, people be able to not just immediately discount Fedora and say, well, I want to play games, so I'm not going to use this. Langdon White says in the comments that we should watch for DevConf US keynote announcements. Something is about open source gaming. N nice, nice plug I'm there. I'm going to chime into what David said. Right. So um, plus one to that. I mean, with the Steam Deck or something, whatever it's called, coming right around the corner and there would be a lot of development with Proton. I see that as a total possibility because we might just have a gaming spin in some time around. Who knows? But my pie in the sky is something that Justin started articulating in some weeks before. 
that is Fedora Linux to become a digital public good. Oh my God, that would be one of the great things that can happen to this community and well, to our offerings, to be honest. So, uh, yeah. Okay, I'll go next. <laughs> so yes, plus one to the uh, digital public good. Yes, I'm very excited about that. And also really looking forward to Fedora having more and more contributors, especially in the web development part, and also growing the mentorship and the documentation guide. So, so I'm excited about all those. I also want to be part of it. So, so let's see how that goes. Okay, I'll add my comment too. Um, the same thing I say uh, when when I'm answering questions for a FESCO election. Uh, what's really important to me is is removing friction uh, that prevents people from joining as a contributor or uh, a co-maintainer of a package or adding a new one or something like that. Anything we can do to improve that. In the past couple of years, we've seen a whole lot of improvements, which is really great. So just moving forward in that direction evolving with how how development trends change that's what i want to see a more efficient federal join process for better contributor sustainability that would be a great way a great thing to look forward to and more companies shipping federal by default if we can order more find the sky if i can order the daughter dell xps with federal that would be great I would like. Um, I, I saw an article. I don't about some some new Linux desktop that somebody had developed that the author liked on, on Twitter the other day. And one of the comments was, "And they haven't even made an operating system for it yet. They're like it's not a spin. It's just like it's just a desktop environment." And what I would like is for those projects to never feel like, "Oh, I need to go make an OS to go underneath it." Like that's. That's what this is like. That should be the boring thing that we're taking care of as a project. So if you've got some sort of new, I would like to see new desktop environments, whatever, new software, uh, new spins, new new things people want to do. Next time somebody goes to make a thing like CoreOS, I want them to feel like doing it in Fedora is the easiest way to get what they want and uh, make that uh, easy and welcoming for those kind of projects so that um, we actually are a home for those kind of innovation. Cool, did everyone go? Ben, did you wanna chime in? I just like to be able to hear everyone without going. <laughs> I gotcha. Um, well, I think we all went around on that one. Um, there's one more, let's try to fit it in because we have a couple more minutes and this will be our last one, okay. Web standards are increasingly integrating with OS, with Fedora 34 notch. Okay, prefer reduced motion or dark mode. With Fedora 34 not shipping with either, or Firefox giving up on PWAs, how is Fedora looking to tackle these? That's actually a good point, you know with applications who are integrating how websites look like with how their operating system looks like, even if it's dark mode in the operating system, lo and behold, you'll open up a website and it is dark as well. So you don't have to go eyes blaring on a screen just because you shifted windows. So uh, uh, something that I would like to know about as well. The last one's uh, stumping us, huh? Anyone else on? Well, the, the workstation uh, group would, would be a great one to uh, involve in the discussion here. And, and maybe that's a topic we can bring up on the Devel mailing list. I know engineering rep, so I say, let's all go to the development mailing list. But uh, I think it's it's a good one where we should have, uh, you know, maybe maybe a session where we discuss what are the, you know, what are the use cases we're, we're talking about? Because, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of good examples from people, but, uh, what should we focus on? What have they already uh, tackled? Um, you know, maybe maybe it's not quite as much work as we think it is, uh, but it's not something that I specifically know a lot of details about, but I would say involving the workstation group would be the first step. Excellent. 
Uh, assuming in-person flock happens next year, would it be in the EU or the US? So we have uh, a, <laughs> a contract, a down payment still in place for Detroit flock. And uh, that was not something we could take back. So the idea is that we will be in Detroit in 2022 if it's in person. That's the idea. So we might have to switch things up. I know there's a schedule back and forth with EU versus NA. So I don't know. I got to check in with some folks on how we're going to make that okay for everybody. I think there was a reason. Like there's a different conference, right, that we're trying to avoid or something. Yeah. Uh, it, yes, Red Hat Engineering has asked that we be in Europe in the same year that the uh, Red Hat Summit is in Boston so that they're not doing too, because the other Red Hat Summit is in San Francisco, which is expensive for travel, for Red Hat's travel budget. So we could get more Red Hat Engineering there if we do that. And it's generally beneficial to the project if we have as much Red Hat Engineering there as we can, so. Cool. Uh, should we try to stick a few more questions in? How do you start a SIG? Well, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to get the SIG declaration stick. And you've got to hold <laughs> the stick and you say, I declare SIG! <laughs> That's how we, I don't know how we do it anymore. Yeah. That was the it, long it, it's a very lightweight process. Um, it ba basically, uh, you just find some people who are interested and declare that you have a SIG. Um, in order for it to actually be a real thing, like having regular meetings is important. And you want to have like regular meetings and documentation and some basic like contact procedures ch channels and then make sure those are active. Uh, one, one of our problems really is it's so easy to start a SIG and it is not automatic to unstart a SIG. So we've got a lot of SIGs that are not actually alive and no way of telling. Um, that's one of the things we're actually working on um, and have don't have a good solution for yet. But starting one, very easy. I see we're losing council members. I think some of them might be heading to other sessions and we're very close to the end of our time. Is there anyone who could answer this question? What is Fedora's relationship with overt oh we hate those guys i mean seriously <laughs> if they come around again we're gonna teach them a lesson that they will never forget never ever forget <laughs> um no that's that's not right it uh it's appealing but no uh so i i think um Overt is the upstream for a project uh, for you for a you know, um, Red Hat's virtualization platform that runs on RHEL, and the Overt team has had trouble keeping up with the pace of the Fedora kernel over the years. So they tend to target CentOS uh, instead as a as the platform that they're working on. Um, I would love for them to target Fedora, but I understand the issues with keeping up with the latest kernel. Uh, that's hard for them to do. Well, it's not just the kernel, isn't it, uh, Java? Actually, the majority of it is Java. And uh, okay, some so... of it is kernel as well. Even though they kind of advertise that Fedora is supported, <laughs> it is still in trouble waters. <laughs> what is Java is our question. That is very valid. Thank you, Miro. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we right. uh, we just hope that they will rewrite over it in Python and then, you know, we can just uh, include it in Fedora. That's fun to that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So I think that there were might have been a couple of questions that we missed. They were either going to be a super long conversation or they might have come in after. I know so the answer to them. It, the okay. answers are yes, yes, maybe, and um, ask Ben Cotton. Mostly the last one. <laughs> the last one always works. Just yeah. kidding. Just kidding. Um, but I was going to say, if you do have more questions, the council has uh, IRC meetings, and we also have a monthly video call that you can be a part of, and we put those recordings up on YouTube. We usually have um, a guest who comes and talks about the latest and greatest or some kind of project that's happening within Fedora. 
So we have those means we also have a mailing list. Oh no, we don't, we have a discussions page and we have um, a Peugeot repo. So if you have more questions for us, want to talk about these types of things, we're open to that. So feel free to join us in one of those places and I'm on to the next session. I'll see y'all over there. Thank you everyone. Bye everybody. See you, folks.